Yeah. Okay, so we have quorum. Yeah, All right, then. I'd like to call to order the Salem Kaiser Area Transportation Study. It is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. And going through roll call real quick. Uh, so I'm Kathy Clark for Kaiser, and I see Commissioner Mordhorst. Bob Motors, Spokane Commissioner. Montana. Anna Hansen, Oda. Trevor. Uh, Trevor Phillips, Salem City Councilor. Maria. Maria Inojos Pressey, Salem Kaiser School Board. And then um, is uh, Sadie or somebody from Trans, or not Trans, uh, um, isn't it uh, Sarah for Transit now? Or is it Sadie? Uh, it's still Sadie. Okay. And she's not present yet. And is uh, Kevin Cameron there? No, not yet. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll move right along then. Uh, the first order of business is approval of the uh, minutes from March 28th. Were there any additions or corrections noted? Hearing none, motion to approve as presented. A motion. All second. Moved by Lyle, seconded by Maria. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying no. Hearing no objection, motion passes unanimously. Uh, the next item is public comment. And I can't see the room, so I'm going to leave it to um, Lyle if you would let us know if there's anybody in the room for public comment. Um, I do not see anyone. Not All at right. this time. Is that Kevin? Yes. Sorry, Madam Chair, I was late. All right, just barely. So fantastic. Uh, then we will move on to item D, which is changes to the U.S. Census Bureau delineated Salem urban area. Ray, you're up. Okay. So in your uh, packet is a short memo uh, discussing the changes in the Salem urban area as from the Census Bureau. And so the presentation will just go roughly what the memo is talking about what a urban area is according to the US Census Bureau, what new urban area is and what the implications are for the MPO and what happens next. After each uh, U.S. decennial census, the U.S. Census Bureau uh, uses a methodology nationwide to define urban areas. So these are cl uh, cl uh, clusters of census blocks, where it's or the smallest uh, census geography that they use uh, to define areas. And <clears throat> urban areas are a collection of these census blocks that have either 2,000 households or roughly 5,000 persons at a minimum. These methodologies and the definitions change over time. So the, there have been changes since the 2010 census, as you'll see on the maps that uh, I'm gonna show. Also important to point out is there is essentially no opportunity to contest or, or uh, contest, I can't think of a better word, the results with the Census Bureau because they're doing this nationally for everyone. Uh, we don't have the staff to make reasonable uh, critiques. Uh, so this Nothing is reasonable work. <laughs> yeah. So this is just a re quick overview of the SCATS area. So that's shown in red on this. And uh, the uh, blue areas are the urban areas as defined in the 2010 census, the Salem urban areas. So when we're done with this process and the process will take eight to 12 months to go through and do all this work, all that blue will be part of SCATS. Uh, how we connect it, it will be, it will provide some options of how we're connecting all these, but and what we'll show today are a little bit more detail what each of these uh, areas are that will be connected. Uh, I also put on, on Kim put on the Almsville uh, UGB and the state UGB as those are the two adjoining uh, cities that are um, 
near the, the urban areas. Also on the map are the is the air quality boundary, which sets a minimum for what we need for the, the well, we can't change it. It's the MPO will include that area plus the urban area the, the plus the urban area that is in blue. And adjoining areas are connected. So um, I'm sorry, quick yeah. question. So you're saying that Almsville, which is in blue now, yeah. and Brooks up at the north, those will be included in the yeah, air quality boundary? Uh, no, in the MPO boundary. Right. So they're, they they're, they're outside the air quality boundary. So, so the air quality boundary is not changing? No. Okay, yeah. thank you. It's, yeah, I'm just meaning that on the west side where we have basically the air quality boundary, the air quality boundary is setting the MPO boundary everywhere other than where the new urban areas are. Okay. Um, the air quality boundary will not change. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. Oh, it's fine. So uh, in your, your, your packet, there are some maps. I'm going to show some ones on screen so we can all see in a little bit more detail. Five main areas, uh, Brooks, south of I, uh, then we have uh, I-5 south of Delaney, uh, then we have a lot of stuff to discuss on Oregon 22 East going down to Almsville and towards State. So let me pop out of that and go to, oops. Okay, so, <clears throat> First off, this is the um, essentially the same same uh, maps that we were showing, just a little bit bigger area. And I, well, I can also send you links if you're interested in seeing this in, in detail for yourself. Uh, <clears throat> just showing where the old boundary was, or the old urban area. So that's the uh reddish well the orange coloration and then the red is showing the new urban area and then we can also see this a little bit better granted all these uh, mapping programs are best used on your own device as opposed to this so this is uh, as is the urban area is defined from the 2010 census and then we can slowly move our little magical Divided over, you can see additional area um, in the north and south. So what I'm going to do is mouse uh, move in and show you some of these areas. So this is Brooks. Um, the red shows where we are. Boundary is currently. The blue shows the urban area that we need to bring in. You'll notice that the only area is right here. And if I turned on air photos, and as you can see in the, the packet, that's the NORPAC plant. So we're bringing in processing of vegetables and some cow uh, properties into the urban area. Um, it makes sense to me. Yeah. I, I, all these make a thousand lots of sense. Uh, going further south, or going all the way south. <clears throat> we have the this little section um, on the south of Delaney. So Delaney is the, the red line, and that's also the SCAF's boundary currently. And this is going down towards uh, Silver Side Road. And so this is just along I-5. Thank you. Is that red line Delaney now? Yes, yes that's that's Delaney now. So and this is yeah, the sunny side. This is south along I five uh, towards yeah, sunny okay. side. Okay. Enchanted Forest is right here, right at the south. There's also um, Lima Valley Vineyards. Is that in there? Uh, no, that's south. No, Lima Valley is the next one south. Yeah, so this oh, is Hope. Sunny side, this is Hope Valley Resort. Um, RV resort. It's also a, there's also a tiny home, yeah. which is the That's resort it. and yeah. storage. And, but we're not actually taking in the tiny homes. We're just taking in the administration office. So that is roughly uh, here. And I should have turned on the base map. 
it's yeah. yeah, it's kind of it's a little hard to see in, in our printed copy. Yeah. But. So it would get the self storage, oh. but not the um, some of them. So. Some, some of them, but there's so you know most of them are over here outside the boundary, and so it will be yes. So that's that area. The next one is over here on twenty two. Oh, where are we? Okay, so uh, to give a little context, we're on highway. This is Highway 22. Uh, Salem is up at the north. Red is still our boundary. So all this area where the mouse is is currently within SCATS. Uh, so this area will be included. There is. Apologize for the slow <laughs> mouse. Um, we, there's this area uh, right here, and then a further area that is outside the Scats boundary that will need to be brought in. Um, these all seem to be large lot residential or small ag. Then we come down, and then this brings us to Almsville, uh, which it brings in the city of Almsville, but it does the not shown on here is the brown. Yeah, it is. So the very hard to see brown line is the uh, Almsville UGB. So we do not actually include all of the UGB or it's not defined as we as part of the urban area. This, but everything else in Almsville is part of the Salem urban area. So it will be part of the MPO after this process. And then further uh, going southeast-ish, uh, there's more what I think is large lot uh, residential to the southeast of Almsville in this triangular, there we go, triangular area. And then also to along 22, we're picking up, they've de defined this area as an urban area as the um, yes, we yes, sir. That's what we will be gaining. Um, so Almsville will be part of the MPO, and then this area. This one's scroll faster. So this is um, on the right here. This is Golf Club Road. This is the State and UGB. So we and this is a. Ford dealer slash RV dealer. Um, I don't know the name, Karen. It's Power RV. Power RV, thank you. Um, and so that area is also will be included in the MPO. But we don't, none of the uh, urban area, none of the Salem urban area does not go into the state and city limits. So it is proposed not to bring Staten in as well. We're just going through their UGB, the very Northwest tip that uh, has that inter interchange. So those are the areas. Are there any questions about the areas or oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> beyond the, the <laughs> ones? <laughs> uh, or, you know, if, and I will send out, I can have sent, or send out a link to these so you can get more information. Well, thanks, Ray. So uh, we contacted, staff contacted the uh, city manager of Almsville. They don't have any idea about this, um, that this is happening. And so I don't know how we, and I guess it's not an option from what I'm looking at. Well, and not if they want a representation of projects that might be in their area. Right. So, so who is going to out to do outreach to them? Yeah, there's a process to add them to the MPO board. We have to amend the agreement, and that's something we're planning to do this year. And I, I talked to at least Dillis Sweeney on the council about it. She, I think she's told some other counselors, but I haven't contacted the city manager. City manager, he, he needs to know, so he can present to the city council um, and let him know what their options are and what their benefit or downside is to 
in doing this. Yeah. yeah. We wanted to first kind of go over this with our policy committee just to show uh, show you what the process we're going through. Yeah. Now we don't have a lot of choices about where these census urban areas are, but we know we have to include them. So yeah, I, I mean I, I can see Almsville being a obviously an urban, potentially an urban area based on the criteria you said. 2,000 homes or 5,000 people, right? I don't understand why <clears throat> uh, Golf Club Road doesn't have that. I mean, they, they don't have 2,000 people or 5,000 homes. Yeah, there, and there are other- who, who draws this crazy stuff? There are other criteria <laughs> as well, uh, but yet now this is a puzzling, you know, there are other criteria that are used by the census beyond. Uh, so that's how we get the jump to Almsville going over some non-urban areas. But yeah, I would agree that the uh, Golf Club Road is a puzzling one. Uh, the Delaney one is slightly puzzling because we're not actually taking in any housing, we're taking in uh, storage. Uh, the Brooks, where we're taking in a, 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 a ag plant, a food processing plant, doesn't seem to meet their definitions. And so they do have, uh, you know, impervious surface, they look at impervious surface and commute patterns and some other, if the land is supportive of the urban area, but, you know, I think we could reasonably say, well, that doesn't seem to be applying to the uh, most of these uh, areas that I was showing, which gets back to the unfortunate, we can't really contest or question or get clarification even of why some areas are brought in, other areas are not defined as urban areas, even if they seem to be identical in land use from just looking at the air photos. Is it a federal project? Well, yes. yes. sure. First of all, it's not federal. every single little piece we're grabbing is 2,000 people or 5,000. It's like an identified urban area. So the, the sale of urban area has to have at least 5,000 people. We obviously know it does. But a place like, let's say, Otis near the coast, it can't be an urban area because it probably doesn't have 5,000 people. So we can't have an Otis urban area, even if there are 1,000 people. So it's not, it's if the urban area has to have 5,000 people. Not every little part that we're adding has to have 5,000 people. They start with an urban area and they have an algorithm, algorithms to say, okay, here's an urban area. Here are the adjoining urban density areas that are census blocks. And they have things called hops and jumps that tell you how far to expand that urban area. What's the kind of the travel share and the boundaries of the urban area. So these little pieces don't aren't each 2,000 people. I'm afraid to ask this, but huh? I'd almost like to see the definition of their urban area. Um, yeah. But yet at the same time, trying to read it would probably be the most confusing thing yeah. you would ever see. Not the most confusing, but it's up there. <laughs> we try to, it is multi-step and it does take yeah. other considerations. We try to summarize it on the, in a memo on the top of page two in the first paragraph. There's a lot of detail. We kind of boil it down to its essentials in that first paragraph. Of first saying this is an urban area, then what's added around it. There's these hops and jumps that define where else they go out until they can't do that anymore. And that kind of sets the limits of the urban area. That's why we're not going as far as sublimity or no city or, or it's independence or monument because yeah. they're too far the jumps are too far yeah there's an intervening development is sparse <laughs> enough that that they doesn't jump um there's a few comments there is a few comments so um <clears throat> i guess uh a couple of people uh, kathy and mark bernard both said that they mentioned to the Almsville city manager and the mayor um this is Happening. So it's <clears throat> not a complete surprise. The other bit is just to wrap up the presentation is hear this. Uh, what happens next? So we um, this is a multi-step process. Uh, I actually was just contacted by ODOT's consultant today to set up find a time to talk about this because ODOT is a, uh, employed a consultant to help the MPOs and other jurisdictions that need to find urban areas and all the 
work related to it um, going forward. So first is we'll come, we'll, the urban area will connect the dots, the parts that are not contiguous. This will be part of a reviewing and revising the federal aid urban boundary where the federal funds that we receive can be spent. So it defines urban first rule. Um, uh, we'll have a presentation about that at a later date once we have some uh, areas defined and you know, options available. From the from that, then we're talking about the SCATS boundary. What it you know looks because the, the <laughs> middle eight urban boundary is smaller than the MPO boundary. Uh, so the SCATS boundary, you know, there are a lot of options of how we can connect all those blue areas that you saw on the screen and then your pamphlet. Uh, connect them together to uh, define the MPO area. It, you know. Adding more area does not change the amount of money that we're going to get. Our funding is tied to the population as defined as the urban area. So the areas that were in blue, not the SCATS MPO boundary, unless there is a different formula that we have with ODOT, but I think that's true for most things. As we're going through the boundary, you know, we're also talking about Almsville because there's also the political, the policy type questions of how do we bring in Almsville? How do we change the modify the agreements that we currently have for SCATS, the bylaws for PC and the TAC, and all those other policy related documents? How should those be changed? Will we do it like we did for Turner, which was essentially add City of Turner to everything, make sure they're represented on the PC and TAC? Uh, and leave it at that, or do we want to open it up and make other changes? Because this would be a time to do it. The second one is more technical, and this is also mainly what the uh, consultant that ODOT has retained will be working with it. And that's looking at the functional classification for all the roads within the federal aid urban boundary, ensuring that what we say last time was an arterial is still an arterial, you know, whether it's urban or rural. Arterial, that's easy because if it's in the fob, it's urban, if it's out, it's rural. But so it's mainly just a lot of tedious work that we'll be going through and doing that. And we'll be bringing you the results so you can adopt them or uh, see what they are. We'll also be looking at the, the, the critical urban freight corridors that we discussed last month, I think, uh, just in case we get more mileage. If we don't, you know, I don't think we need to make any changes as uh, from what we changed last month. After all that is done, you guys will adopt the boundary, the bylaws, you know, functional classification. The changes will be submitted to ODOT, at Federal Highway, and the, and the governor, because that's part of the process. Um, and then we'll wait another 10 years and see how our boundary changes because the definitions of urban areas will change again because I'm sure the Census Bureau is going to get a lot of uh, comments beyond this. So I see Trevor has a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. And it's interesting to see, you know, the, the changes that come with a census update. Um, I, I guess, you know, I've talked kind of preliminarily with uh, Mayor Salem, who's had some conversations with staff. I think we're aware that uh, there was a likelihood that Omsville uh, would be added uh, to SCATS. Um, I, I don't know how to ask this in the most, uh, I'm just trying to get information, but could we theoretically add representation for a large population center such as the city of Salem um, in terms of right now, we, you know, we're probably one of the larger cities here and we just have the one member, you know, would this be the time that hypothetically we could also advocate for, you know, getting a second person on SCATS if that was something that the city of Salem wanted? Yes, this would be the time. Yeah, and so we, can I just answer that a little more? So, you know, what SCAT sets up is a cooperative agreement. And so to add on to we'd have to change the cooperative agreement. And because we're changing it, that's when we could make some modifications to that agreement. Right. And then that's part of, in the memo, there's some discussion about redesignation. So changing uh, the number of represented represent votes that Salem gets 
would cause probably redesignation, which means the, the, the governor just has to redesignate us as the MPO with that changed um, voting structure. And I guess by fault, thank you for that. So the answer is yes, we could. Uh, I would like to talk more with staff uh, from the city of Salem and our mayor uh, to figure out what our official stance is. Um, but do we have any like precedent with other communities? Um, like how do they do it? Is it typically just, you know, one member per entity or do they break it up kind of by population? We, the, the MPOs in the state uh, have different ways. Uh, and so larger jurisdictions have more votes. Uh, each one does it slightly different, and we do have a document someplace that uh, has that information that can be provided to the policy committee. And then uh, I think this information is readily available. I'm just not sure how to look it up, but I guess my question would be like, what is, you know, the population of the MPO? I mean, I think it's well over a quarter million um, versus, you know, what's the population of the city of Salem and just kind of getting that percentage to inform um, yeah. that kind of a consideration. Um, so that, that information will be an appendix A of the uh, draft MTP. So you can see those numbers there. They're also shown in chapter four and seven of the draft MTP as well. And I think we have it buried on our website someplace, but I don't know that one off the top of my head. Um, I can send you the link. Right now, is this my follow-up question? Thank you. These are all the questions I was trying to get answered. But do we? Is this just we? Ex, we're, this is informational today, and there's no action, or will there be an action that's needed? Well, at the time? Uh, thank you for reminding me. Uh, so the only action today is really, uh, as stated on the the cover sheet, is I'd like some direction from the policy committee of when I'm looking at options for uh, changing the MPO boundary. You know, there are areas that we could remove that are currently not defined as urban areas, nor are they within the air quality boundary. Uh, do we, would you like to see options where we take land, those places out or just ones leave the current boundary and then expand it to take in the urban areas as uh, defined by the Census Bureau? <clears throat> and then, you know, assuming that you would like me to take in the minimum amount of land possible, this is that will make everyone's life easier. But, you know, let me know how you would like, what sort of options you'd like to see. Thank you. Um, so to that point, which I think is that uh, decision making, and uh, it will be really helpful to send out to the group, you know, how we've been um, structured in the past as a um, you know, one vote for each jurisdiction. Uh, when Turner came in, it was with the same uh, vote as, um, as everybody else. And so that's the conversation that I think we're all gonna have to have if we're going to make this a little more weighted or if we're just gonna keep uh, the what we have right now, which does uh, encourage a lot of um, collaboration and conversation. Uh, between the different jurisdictions that are involved. Uh, but to the point of the question that uh, Ray just asked, one of the, my, okay, my input on that is that we keep in what we have in so that we have continuity. So even places that maybe if there are some, some breaks in the action that we look comprehensively at the land that will be in the spaces and how they're managed between uh, point A and point B, one of the issues we've had between Turner and Salem is to be able to sufficiently develop the infrastructure between those two uh, cities so people can uh, travel between the two. So my preference, and I'll open it up to the group, is to not remove anything, add what we need to, so we can keep on uh, being comprehensive. Other input? And I guess I'd, I would agree with that um, we've all been really well to work together uh, the history of scats is going way back has always been a uh, teamwork and collaboration to get things done and adding mm -hmm. another vote um, trevor i understand your statement but at the same time um Sim, to school district 
is the Salem member. And also uh, Cherry's representation is another Salem member. So you basically have three Salem votes. Mm -hmm. And just adding in the Holmesville, I totally get it. But I think I'd like to keep it as small as possible and just bring the one on, but then add extra votes besides that. Well, this, excuse me for saying this, but this discussion is really premature because we're going to have this discussion again. Yeah. Um, and the reason Bray brought up the consultant is ODOT wants to work with all the MPOs that are making some changes. So it's fairly consistent. So when they are presenting it as a state agency to the governor, they can kind of say, we used a, we used a similar process to review the, the changes to the boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. This is really the preview of why we're changed, why the urban area has to change. Um, there's things we can't do much about. Those urban area, blue areas are pretty locked in. And the boundary changes to the SCAS area are pretty, they aren't that difficult to make. There's only a few areas of options. Um, we and, we and Ray will be bringing those back again. Uh, but so this is a preview. And again, and the, as far as the members, members and representation on the committee, we're going to have a whole packet for you saying, you know, here is the current cooperative agreement. Uh, obviously, you know the membership. We're going to provide an updated list of what we know uh, about other MPOs and their representation. Uh, last month, I emailed every MPO manager and asked them, here's what we think your representation is. Is it correct? And they responded with, you know, changes to that. So we want to show you what other MPOs are doing as far as their voting membership. So you have an idea of what you want, what you may want to do, keep the same one jurisdiction or one agency per vote or change it to something else. I think you should have that as a background before you make any decisions and or at least discussions, deliberations, decisions. And we have time to do that. We don't need to make it right away. Sarah has that. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate hearing we're going to get a whole packet about this. Um, I do think that, you know, we don't get a lot of opportunities to look at the structure and we have a lot of new faces and it's nice for us all to make sure we're on the same page. I guess my only re request was just to repeat what the name of the document was again. I, I know that you're going to be sending us a packet, but I think this might, I might need a little extra time to read into it. So can you, can you say what the name was again of, of where the breakdown is for representation and all of those pieces so I could go look some of it up on my own in, a, in advance? Well, the, yeah, we could definitely send you the Thank cooperative you, agreement. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I just didn't write it down. It online. Yeah, the cooperative agreement, is, I think it's online. It is. Indeed. Yeah. And we put it in every uh, unified planning work program. So if you have a copy of that or look at that, we oh, always perfect. have that. Thank uh, you. I couldn't what get we the, don't have right now is the, the information I gathered in the last month or so that says what are the other MPOs' um, most recent representation. But that'll be in a packet. In, Maybe the next meeting or, or two meetings from now, we have to staff have to work through the process we want to go through. I to totally understand. I just didn't write it down fast enough. Thank you yeah. very much. So if you look up, if you look online or look in one of our, yeah, right, I, so I, sent, I sent the link. Oh, you sent the link. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they just sent it out. It was yeah. way easier. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, to the main question about whether to simply add what we need to or look at adding and deleting. Do I hear anybody who would disagree with um, adding what we need to and not deleting so we don't create gaps? Ray, well, yeah, I think you have your answer. Yep, thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, this will come back to us for further conversation and uh, we look forward to talking about how we are going to proceed. One of the things I would also point out is that uh, each MPO is unique and uh, uniformity across the MPOs for any sort of uh, any, anybody's sort of OCD is uh, not something we have to do. We are unique and we can continue to be our own MPO structured in a way that works for us. So there's that. Um, are you ready to go on to item E, which is comments received for the MCP and TIP? Kim? Good, thank you. Um, and Ray's going to run my PowerPoint here for you. Um, as you, as the policy committee knows, last month you released the draft documents of the MTP and the TIP for public comment. This is going to give just start with a quick overview of what we do to get the word out. So um, just prior to, I said, start off with saying we, we did give 
a combination of staff, we went and presented to the five community partnership teams. That was in March, actually, just before public comment period started, that represent in the area. That's North Neighbors, the East Salem, Salem um, community, Kaiser United, the South Salem um, Ordinance Group, and Edgewater. Um, and they're often they're represented by many members of neighborhood associations also attend those meetings, but a number of liaisons and community liaisons. So we made presentations to all of them. Um, public review began on March 28th after the policy committee meeting. We updated, we have draft documents by chapter are available on our website. Um, the, we have a transport transportation hub that has a little bit more um, um, bells and whistles associated with it. We have uh, two interactive maps, which have the projects for the TIP and the MTB, so people can go on and leave comments or um, general comments or comments specific to projects that are on there. And we uploaded video links of um, presentations to the policy committee and overview of what the MTB plan looks like, what the TIP plan looks like. And um, so that somebody doesn't have to read, they could click and watch if they would like for an option. We have um, an interested parties email list of approximately 250 um, people, organizations, and communities. So we've been emailing them with links or updates or the links to the videos. Um, um, many of the people who are on, people or organizations on that list include, for example, the communications team that's at the city of Salem or the city of Kaiser um, or Turner, so that we often cascade, we dovetail on some of their work. We've updated um, our Facebook page um, with a number of updates when we've had information. And then we, we mailed, we have a actual physical mailing list of about 350 addresses. So we mailed postcards to those saying public comment period with a link to the website, the, QR, the ways they can give us comments. They can go to the maps, they can email, they can call. So um, we sent out press releases. Um, we've given public service announcements public access. Our COG Connection newsletter goes out every two weeks with links and information. We have brochures, both paper and kind of an electronic version. Some of the brochures are very detailed with, like for the tip, the very specifics of the projects. We also have some general trifold brochures that say at a higher level of what we're doing. Um, we have them both in English and Spanish. Uh, we held an open house on uh, April 11th, and we held it actually at the, we didn't make anybody ride the slow elevator. We, we met them in the lobby downstairs, and it actually, we had 14 people who attended. I'll give you a minute on that, just a minute. Um, and then, so comments that we have received so far, we've included in the agenda, this, this packet, which are um, some feedback we got from the open house, and then, uh, a little bit of email back and forth of people we followed up with, and then comments that are from the currently the online map as so the tip map and the MTP map, um, and then one more set of comments we'll get to in just a second. So our open house we had open just from four thirty to six, and we had four of us were down there, and we had fourteen people come, <laughs> which is more than we expected. Um, we had a handful of written comments. We did pull out a comment card, which I transcribed and put into the packet. Um, we had lively discussion. We had a number of representatives who were from 350.org um, with general comments and concerns about, about increasing good connectivity, increasing bike opportunities, sidewalk opportunities, and reducing greenhouse gases. Um, and and like I said, summarized a few that were written down. Um, the online map uh, for the long range plan for the MTP currently had 24 comments, and I've had them summarized here. They're project specific. And for the tip, they've received seven comments so far. They're just sort of a little chart here. When we give you the final number next month, we always summarize up until right to the policy committee. We also have a feature that's on those maps where somebody can hit the little heart icon that they like the project. And I do, we keep track of those. I just didn't bring that summary. Um, and now I'm gonna let Ray talk about it. <laughs> also attached in your agenda item is. So uh, right before the PC meeting last month, Sammy provided 
uh, comments on most of the chapters, and they are enclosed in your last six pages of the document. These are the uh, legal citations, and I've also it gives you the page, the paragraph, the comment. Uh, this is provided a, in a PDF, and I didn't want to give you a big PDF, so I have a column called clarification where I'm trying to give you the context of where she's making her comment. So if you're trying to find it in the yeah, without reading the document or just looking through, it seems like you're looking for. So much, Ray, just yeah. a quick question. These are all from Sadie. Yeah. She okay. covered all but three chapters. Thank you. Yes. And uh, I would say most of her, her uh, comments were just you know, requesting clarification. Some of my uh, statements needed elaboration. So if somebody who isn't me, who doesn't work transportation, might understand what I'm trying to say and ensure that the general public understands what's going on and putting dates to some of the when things happen. So ridership was end of December. Well, so you'll see, um, yeah, so that, that's that's those. Um, and then, uh, am I seeing this one as well? Yeah. Sure. Uh, one of the things that came out from the, uh, the open house was the uh, learning that the McGillicris project uh, cost is not what I had written down or Karen had written down on the tip or long range plan. And so we had discussions with Salem staff and have revised the cost to what they are um, as of yesterday or this morning. Uh, so up to 34 million for phase two. So that's the corridor bit. Phase one is the um, realignment at 22nd. Uh, and the proposal is, you know, this is just one of the, so in the tip, they, because it's uh, for the draft tip, they, they being Steve, uh, are going to make the change for the cost to ensure that it's uh, up to date. My proposal for the MTP is to add a banner on the top of the financial chapter that says financial constraint as of January 31st, 2023. I don't want to go through and redo all the financial constraints for the projects. Granted that it has increased quite a lot. And so something would have to come off and I'd have to redo, redo all the other work. In fact, so that's, that's a proposal. Let me uh, tell me if I'm way out of line on that one. Um, Ray, you guys are Phil's his hand. Ask about that. Yeah. No, thank you. Yes, Trevor. Thank you. Um, hang on just a second. Okay. So uh, I've seen this uh, going around some of the, um, you know, I don't know, citizen groups on social media and other discussion boards where the cost increase has happened here. I'm aware that there's, uh, you know, multiple phases involved. Uh, one of the, I think they're summing the two phases or more, but I've seen it, the, the, the cost now estimate for this is like 50 million or over 50 million. Yes. Um, is that about accurate? That's uh, for the entire project from phase one to phase three. So doing the realignment, doing the corridor and the funds that have already spent on right away, and whatever PE has been done before, that's 50-ish million. Um, that's a nice idea to change. And what was the prior cost estimate? So like, if you were to look at the total project now it costs like 51, what was it, you know, before, you know, the realities of inflation or everything? Uh, so shown on the, so, so shown on here is, uh, so phase one, which is the realignment that was five-ish, although I think that was a revised number as well. And it's currently 10 million. And phase two, which is the rest of the corridor from 12 to 25th that was 16 ish million and now it's someplace around 33 34 do uh, with so that includes um the 34 million it includes a, a kind of a separate piece that is to do the storm drainage the the culvert which on will, I'm on Pringle Creek yeah which will be a separate piece that's added to this. So the 16 million never included that. Uh, but so when you start adding all the pieces of this, 
you know, we had a, a project um, that's not in the current tip that was like 6.8 million to acquire the right of way. That's included in the 50 million that you're you're seeing that 50 million. So there's lots of pieces to it. But what you're asking today, I think, you know, the the what's different about it is basically the addition, the, base, the doubling of cost of, of the 22 realignment piece, and basically the doubling of cost of the milk of the entire project that was funded by the raise grant, the remaining the corridor of it. So um, part of that was when we put that originally in the tip back in October, all we got was the raise grant. They hadn't gone through and updated their cost estimates. Uh, so this revised cost estimate to 34 million isn't really just recent. It was just they never really looked at the cost estimate and we didn't add the local funds to the project, just what was applied for by the raise grant. We didn't have that information yet. So yeah, it's 50 million when you add all these pieces up. Okay, and and it's gone up quite a bit. Um, how much? I mean, at this point, with it fully designed and ready to go, is there anything that could be done hypothetically to um, get us closer to completion on this, like in terms of cost savings, or is this just because it's designed to meet federal standards um, to comply with the raise grant? This is just what it is. Julie, <laughs> I mean, we can't answer, answer for Salem. So that's why we have to rely on your yeah. staff to kind of answer those kind of questions. Yeah, and and we could have more conversations with our engineering staff if you would like. Um, but the scope has not increased. Um, there is one part that's off site that Karen was mentioning, which is a, a crossing of Pringle Creek that is related and has to sort of be done, but isn't actually directly in the corridor. Other than that, the scope has not increased. It's just costs, as we have seen with lots of projects, have you know gone up significantly. I will say our engineers are probably also being a little bit conservative right now, given the cost escalations. And so hopefully there will be the opportunity for some, you know, cost savings, but you know, they're not counting on it right now. Okay. And we can follow up uh, after today's meeting to get more specifics. Can you remind me, like, what is the the maximum we could get through the raise grant? The raise grant amount that we asked for was about, what, 13 million? 13 million. I about 13 million. And when we asked for that, we can't get any more. You know, we can't get any more from that. Okay. Had we asked for, you know... 25 million, you know, who knows? We might have been able to get it. I don't know. It's can't tell after the fact. Okay. Thank you. All right, any other you, questions? Yeah, I have one. Do you have the 13 million raise grant currently? Yes. The, the 13 million, well, we don't have it in the bank. Okay, let's go. Yes, and so we, yes, we are in the final stages of developing, well, I say final, <laughs> we are in final stages of developing the draft agreement with federal high, ODOT and Federal Highway Administration. We were told it would probably take about a year to get through that process, and so I'd say we're a few months into that year, and then once that's finalized, but, you know, <clears throat> we, 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 have, we have been awarded those funds. We have additional local funds, and so we are keeping moving using those local funds until we get the federal funds um, obligated. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just fall. Thank you, Julie. Um, this is, you know, an important project. You know, this is where the the Social Security uh, Administration is. This is where the Salem VA clinic is. Um, there's really no sidewalk or pedestrian, you know, facilities there, infrastructure there at this time. So I do think that this is not just a critical freight a corridor. It, it really services a, a part of the population that is their needs are not met at this time. So yeah, I, I want to see this thing completed. I'm just concerned with the the significant increase in costs. Mm -hmm. Yes, we all are. Just one, one more slide in, in Kim's presentation. So uh, the public review and in comment period closes on the 15th, which is a Monday of uh, May. Uh, 
The next day, we will be uh, assembling all those comments and they'll be sent to you in your May packet. Uh, all those will include everything from the kickoff. So, you know, for the long range plan, the MTP, and for the TIP, they will be separate. Uh, the comments will be associated and included in those documents. Uh, from the beginning of the kickoff last year. Uh, modifications, at least for the long range plan, will also be included in your packet based on the comments that we've seen and to uh, based on staff review as well. Uh, we also have a public hearing scheduled on your PC meeting on May 23rd. I hope you all can attend uh, at noon for the long range plan, the TIP, and the associated air quality conformity determinations. Uh, documents, and I think that's all that you have. Thank you. There's some notes. That's all, yeah. And Sarah, I concur. There's a very good restaurant in that area I visited last week. <laughs> so there are more people going to those that areas through dining and things like that. The couple. Yeah. And, and the brewery walk. Yeah. Miguel Chris. Yeah, Miguel Chris. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, there was oh, this Amy. great to join lady needs to be off camera for now, and then this is okay. the most recent ruling. So um that that's all for the comments received, and you'll see more hopefully uh at your meeting next month. All so right. next when we have the public hearing for both the MTP and the yeah. okay. So one, Confirm that. So next month we have the public hearing and the um, for the tip and the long range plan, and we'll have more comments if they were received between now and then. Just a bit. FYI. And any public comments that are received that day. Okay. Sounds like a plan. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. All right. Uh, thank you, Kim, and everybody for all the work on this. We're trying to engage as much as possible and as broadly as possible for these two plans. Um, now we're going to go on to the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Safety Action Plan. Item F, Mike. Okay. Um, give me a second to share my screen and start my presentation. <clears throat> Here a different screen. Uh, I get the shared screen and I had to start a presentation in oh, never mind. Okay, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So um I've given a little updates in the past about the Metropolitan Transportation Safety Action Plan, uh, but we've made a lot of progress in the last month or so. So I'm going to give you a little overview of the schedule about the information about the open house and the outreach we, we did, then the survey responses, some initial survey responses, and then next steps going forward. Uh, so here's the entire schedule. We kicked off the project in September. Um, we have a project website that I will put in the chat later. Uh, right now, that boxed area is kind of where we've been um, and where we're going. So we've done the public engagement with an open house, number one. And um, instead of community meetings, we've had some focus group meetings. Uh, we've, had, we've had three so far. Uh, our consultants working on safety analysis of all the crash data in order to develop emphasis areas. I'll get, and get to that and explain what that is. And then going forward, um, after that analysis is done and our emphasis areas are determined, we'll be coming up with some solutions at at least 10 locations. We'll have a strategic framework for the plan. We'll have a Another public engagement um, to uh, talk to the public. And then we'll have the draft plan in February with the final plan done in April. So that gives you the kind of the big picture of where we're going. So for the open house outreach, um, we started in, um, I think it was early March, by sending out 30,000 color postcards. Um, nice uh, postcard, and I'll show you in a second. They were both English and Spanish. So um, some nice pictures on it. Show you what we're talking about is both the uh, uh, issues for crashes and, and possible responses, and then information about how to get to the website, why it's important for us to hear from you about your the public's concern about safety and asking them to take the survey. 
And as you can see, it was both in English and Spanish with a QR code. Um, in addition to that, we did a lot of social media uh, posts and videos. Two of them were in Spanish, and we shared those not only on our site, but we shared on the city side, the county side, Salem Street Department, uh, local neighborhood associations, and lots of other sites. It just kind of started spreading out, so we got more and more people aware that we we're doing this survey. Um, just give you a little picture. We did, I think, um, eight videos, maybe nine videos. Um, but as I said, some were in Spanish. So, like, uh, Councilor Gonzalez did one in English and in Spanish. Um, and I think uh, uh, Maria did one in Spanish also. Um, and I wanted to thank the Salem staff and the Cherry staff for all their help in putting this together. Uh, they were they were the ones going out and filming everyone and then helping us post it on the, our websites. Uh, then we did stories and ads in local newspapers, the Statesman Journal, the Kaiser Times, the Salem Reporter, the West Side Newspaper. So we had articles and then two of them we also had um, ads. Kind of looks like a postcard ad. So here are the uh, some of the articles we did in the local newspapers. And then we did uh, other things like email blasts to stakeholder groups. We did some things in community newspapers. I did a radio interview on KMZ. So anything we could think of uh, in the time we had to spread the word out. And I think we had pretty good results. So overall, we had 797 people go to the survey website, answer our survey questions, which I'll show you in a second. In addition to comes in addition to standard survey questions like pick. Pick your answer. We want people to share their stories. What do you, what's your experience with safety or lack of safety in the transportation area in Salem Kaiser? Uh, and so some of them I put in the packet. We, we picked out 20 to put in your packet if you want to look at those. But we have 250 stories. And we're starting to go through a process to kind of summarize the, the main part of each story. For the online map, as you can see in this picture, we had a lot of comments. People could go to the map click on a road and tell us whether, you know, is it an issue with how people are driving? Is it an issue with how people are walking or can't walk there or can't okay. the wrong spot. Sorry, <laughs> clicked in the wrong spot. <laughs> no problem. Um, so you get the idea. Lots of comments and lots of detail in all those comments. And we're going through a process to kind of pull out what the main um, the key messages are from all those comments. But from the survey, uh, when we ask people, when you're tra traveling, how feel, safe do you feel doing whatever activity? Uh, we have individual questions for all these. So we ask them, how safe do you feel riding in a transit vehicle? Do you feel um, very safe, somewhat safe, neither safe or unsafe? Do you feel uh, somewhat unsafe or don't feel safe at all? And for some answers, if, for example, if it was riding a motorcycle, we had, we had options of, well, that's not a mode I take or riding a bicycle, that's not a mode I take. So we have all the individual answers, but I put together these next two charts to kind of show you for those answers where people said they felt either safe or non-safe or, or neither. Um, uh, these first ones show for these modes going across the top, people fairly feel very generally safe riding in a transit vehicle. They feel generally safe driving a vehicle. Um, going, getting to and walking to transit, Kind of split between feeling safe and unsafe, like 40% each. Walking and rolling in general, a uh, little more people feel unsafe doing that than safe. Uh, traveling through intersections, you can see the numbers of people feeling unsafe are, are increasing. And then, um, so here's four, here's five more answers or five more questions. They feel generally more unsafe traveling at night or driving a motorcycle. Remember, these people who, who said they drive, so it excludes the ones that don't drive at all. Uh, traveling during bad weather. Uh, and the, the two most, uh, two categories that they feel most unsafe turns out to be crossing a busy street or riding their bike. And the other, the comments we got from their stories or from the comment map pretty much um, confirm these, these survey questions, you, we see a lot of comments from the comment map, people saying, I don't feel safe walking down the street because there's no sidewalk, or crossing the street because people are not stopping or they're driving too fast. Um, you get the idea. Oh, there's, no, there's no bike lane for me to get from my house to where I'm going to school or, or 
Um, then we asked them a question about um, if we were to develop focus areas for the safety plan, and we gave them a list of eight, pick four areas that you thought were um, your top choices. So we added up all of the answers, and you can see the results on this graph. The top four choices among the survey people, people that was uh, answered the survey, was they want to see more safety at intersections. They want us to focus on speeding, focus on people who are distracted by, while traveling, and safety while walking and rolling. Um, and then there's a little drop off, and then there's, you can see the other one: safety while riding a bike, uh, people under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Safety of aging adults, and then finally the last um, driving a motorcycle or other motor vehicles. So, from their responses, you can see the top four answers kind of floated, floated through those top four on, on the graph. Uh, then we had one question about um, if we were to develop if we were to develop potential strategies, which which ones are you most interested in seeing us develop? And um, once again, there were eight choices. We asked them to pick their top four. And this is pretty, without too much information, you know, on what they would be, just kind of in general, what would you think? Um, they said, well, providing more sidewalks on streets that are missing. And we do that a lot here in Salem, Kaiser and Scats. They want to see more enhanced crosswalks. We've seen a lot more enhanced crosswalks that we've funded either locally or with our federal funds. Um, make intersections safe for everyone is a, their third choice. Make bicycle lanes or separated bike paths, more of them. And then getting to the lower ones, reduce vehicle speeds as a strategy, increase education and enforcement, use speed cameras or red light running cameras. And then there's some other ones that people put in just uh, their own ideas. And we'll have this, we'll have all this information in the report that the consultant's developing, but this is just the first level of uh, presenting this to you as a, as a group. And I should say, if you if you uh, if you don't recall, um, for this project, we have a consultant. Um, DKS is our consultant. We have a project management team that is made up of your local staff from the cities and counties uh, and transit district. And then we have a steering committee uh, that some members of the policy committee are on. And then we have other members, um, some from ODOT, some from um, uh, Kaiser's representation, so from a neighborhood association. So we're fi we're filtering this information through them and having discussions in separate meetings, but I wanted to bring this to the policy committee as well. So you know, af after it comes through uh, back in, in February next year, you'll see the process we went through to develop the safety. So the next steps is uh, we have one final focus group that uh, Teresa and I are working on. Um, we're gonna work on completing the public outreach report. I have a draft of it and we're gonna add some things to it. And then, as I just mentioned, the consultant and the project management team and steering committee are meeting. Um, we had our first steering committee meeting last week to show them some of this information, to talk about focus areas and what they think those focus areas could be. And then uh, going forward, uh, our consultant is going to take all the crash data from the last five years. She's, they're studying this now. We're going over it. The idea is to pick out, and there's a, there's a process. I won't mean, go through the process today, but there's a process to pick the um, locations um, based on severity of crashes and, and other, <clears throat> other information to kind of focus on um, locations we want to focus, we want to study. The other thing is as part of the um, uh, safety action plan is we would have wanted some, some goals or at least a goal for the plan. And that's something that could be, you know, eliminate all um, fatal and serious injury accidents in the Salem Kaiser area. It could be as simple as that. So that's the, that's the next steps. Once again, um, we're kind of right in the first third of the study. Uh, we'll be going through this all summer and I'll give you updates during the year. And uh, we have the draft TSP, obviously we'll be open to you um, for your review. And um, hopefully uh, if you'd like that, we'll make some final edits, we'll have a a final TSP in April. And what we do with that is a whole other discussion, whole other discussion. <laughs> but uh, we have some thoughts about what we'll do once we have the safety action plan completed. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, great work by uh, you and all of the team members and uh, really helping focus in on where we can make uh, potentially great investment for improving safety. Really appreciate that. Any questions 
for Mike before we move on to our tip session. Sadie. Thank you, Chair Clark. I just want to say thank you to Mike and the SCAT staff and the consultants. That was a really excellent meeting. Um, and the engagement, the level of engagement on this online survey, I mean, I think we're up to almost 800 responses, which I think is really fantastic. I mean, that's really an incredible response rate. Um, and I'm just curious, I don't know if any of our area local governments, Salem, Kaiser, Albany, et cetera, have um, anything that would be a corollary, kind of a, a, a their own safety action plan or transportation safety initiatives. Um, and, and because I'm thinking like, how does this trickle down, right? Are there ways for us to, but then I wondered maybe there are also ways for us to integrate work that's already been done at a community level up into the plan. Well, thank you for that question. Um, Go ahead, Mike. Okay. So, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, there are more and more safety action plans in, in the state of Oregon, uh, a lot more than there were, let's say, five years ago. And some of so, some uh, some of the other MPOs, like Bend and Central Lane, um, have safety action plans. Metro has a, a safety action plan. I don't know if they call it quite that, but um, and then the state has a a state level transportation safety action plan that was done in 2016 and they recently updated it in 2021. So we are looking at their emphasis areas and seeing how our safety plan fits in with theirs. There are th certain things that the state will do better than us as far as possible strategies, but there's certain things we'll do because the state won't look at every intersection, but we're going to look at, we're going to focus on certain locations, corridors, intersections, crossings that the a state level plan wouldn't do. So yeah, there are lots of safety action plans, and um, uh, we'll probably be discussing that at our steering committee meetings and other. I mean, Thank you, Trevor. Uh, Great. And I think Thank Julie you. wanted to add something from, from Salem. Um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly put out there that the city of Salem also did the pedestrian um, safety action, or I don't know what we call it, pedestrian safety fatality plan uh, a few years ago, and. So I believe that that information, you know, is folding up into this, um, obviously being reviewed with newer data. And uh, to my knowledge, Marion County has gotten a grant to do a county level um, safety plan. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when the kickoff is. I've talked to staff a little bit, but I'm not sure when the kickoff is. Uh, Carl Lung is, is, is um, leading that. You know, we talked to Janelle. Carl's going to be part of our project management team, so we do have some uh, connection between our plans. At least they know what uh, their plan, our plan looks like as they develop their plan. So. Uh, yeah, Councilor Phillips. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, great comments. I really also want to thank staff, uh, you know, here through the county as well as at the city of Salem. I think it was a really uh, a great coordinated effort to get the 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 really you know high level outreach and, and interaction with the survey. Um, you know, thank you everybody for get helping you know write the 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 blurb that I, I filmed the video on my last shift in the emergency room. Uh, one of the nurses that I work with uh, that I shared in a group that we're part of um, said that she filled it out and her husband did as well. So uh, really appreciate the effort. Um, to answer uh, member uh, City Carney's question, I believe the City of Salem had a few motions that were uh, made by City Council President uh, Virginia Stapleton to move in this direction of, um, you know, the equivalent of a, a safety action plan. Um, you know, it was her motion a year ago, year and a half ago that, you know, we're looking at on the residential streets, um, limiting speed to the 20 is plenty. And then setting the design goal of, you know, aspirationally trying to have no fatalities um, on our uh, infrastructure. So I I'm glad that she uh, is able to participate in the in the safety plan process for the, the MPO as well. Um, so yeah, uh, it's been a great effort. It's fun to be part of it. Thanks, guys. Thank you much. Um, anything else? We look forward to. Um more great information that's going to help advise uh, and direct our projects and uh, increasing safety. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, now we're going to move on to item G, which is the tip modifications. And Steve, you're up. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so this is going to be a very quick one, um, but this is the, the last couple pages in the packet. The, um, it's got a salmon co colored uh, cover page. Um, and you'll just see on the um, inside of there is um, a listing of uh, tip modifications that happened since, uh, in, well, within the last mar uh, month. Um, and all five of these came to the policy committee at the March meeting and uh, met approval. Um, and so since then, uh, the updates have been made to the MTIP and into the STIP system. And just as a reminder, the, the first four of them were to advance preliminary engineering phases of um, projects, uh, both a one Polk County project and then three ODOT projects to move them up into 2023 to get some of the um, engineering work done uh, earlier than expected. And then the last one was adding uh, local funds to the McGillchrist at 22nd realignment project. So, and that's that's kind of the update in the last month. So, all right. Thank you so much. Any questions on any of the tip modifications? Okay. Well, that concludes pretty much what we had on the agenda today. We have under other business, we've got the. Uh, uh, UPWP adoption is coming to us in May. Um, the Oregon Transportation Commission will be meeting in May, on May 11th in Salem, July 13th in Pendleton, September 14th in Eugene, November 9th in Portland, and of course, always available on uh, online. Mike. Yeah, two very quick things. Uh, the reason for the delay in the Unified Planning Work Program is um, there are some last minute changes by the state for us, the amount of funds and some details about those funds. So we wanted to have that all worked out before we came to you with the document. And uh, it wasn't on the, the list, but last Wednesday, we had a very successful Safe Routes to School um, walking event at Washington Elementary School. Um, we walked about, the, there was a local park about a 10 to 15 minute uh, walk from the school. Um, we had several dozen kids, their parents. We had members of the Salem Police Department, including uh, Chief Womack. Uh, we had both superintendents <laughs> in the school district. We had the uh, Christy Perry, who's departing, and um, the new one whose name is on the tip of my tongue. Andrea Castaneda. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, and, and what was nice is that I had a chance to talk to her the whole walk between the park and the school. Um, just sharing my ideas of what Safe Routes School could be for Salem Kaiser. And she shared me her thoughts about how, um, in her experience, kids' uh, perception of where they can roam has changed so much over the decades. When all of us were probably younger, we probably had a bigger safety perception of, well, I can go anywhere. I can go to my friend's house, you know, five blocks away, 10 blocks away. I can ride my bike. And nowadays, that's kind of narrowed, which is a sad state of affairs. So. Um, she was seemed very supportive of having this program part of the um, part of us, part of the school district. So I'm looking forward to having more discussions with her. And um, my coordinator coordinator is right now up in Portland at an active transportation conference to work with other coordinators, learn more about how to get these programs, um, uh, improve them over the years. So those are the two little quick news bits I wanted to add. Thank you so much. Very much looking forward to um, meeting Superintendent Castaneda next week, uh, myself. Um, the next uh, policy meeting will be on May 23rd. And we're also having an open house. So I thought it was public hearing, or is it both? It's just a public hearing. I put down the wrong word. OK, it's public hearing. OK, I thought I heard it earlier. And then the TAC will be meeting on May 9th. And OMPOC is coming up. We have a meeting on, I think it's, uh, it's the 5th. We're going to be having a conversation about our legislative um, agenda, kind of where we're at, and get an update. So when I get that, I will send it out to the group. And, I, and Kathy, I will not be able to make that meeting again on OMPOC. OK. So yeah, this is just a kind of an interim one to catch everybody up on the legislative, but I can make that one. 
Uh, but yeah. thank you. Wow, I appreciate it. And Mayor Clark, I'm on I'm vacation, so I will be sending one of my staff to be determined. Okay. <laughs> uh, they can't see me. I'm in the back. Lunch yeah, discussion. I, just a warning that obviously the next policy committee may go long, and it's very important because we have to adopt three documents. Four. 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 Can Four. we can we send out a new invitation showing that? It's, it's already, I think, a two hour on two hours. So we get it done in two hours. If you guys are quick about it, <laughs> it may depend on how much public testimony there is or isn't. Yeah, yeah. I don't. We, yeah. So there only should be three items: the two adoptions of the plan and the tip, and the adoption of the UPWP. And I don't think we have anything else currently scheduled. That's okay. I guess I was thinking three documents, but yes. Five documents. Oh, four. I don't count the UPWP. Yeah, there's right. there's air quality conformity determinations for each of the plan and the tip. That's why my staff okay. is trying to confuse you right now. Yes, that's why I was saying <laughs> But it, it, it will probably go a little long just Maybe because. Add a half hour to that meeting then so we yeah. can um, block those others yeah. so I don't get yeah. somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Leave early. All right. It's important. Because the, the two of those documents are ones that have to be um, yeah. yes. right. That's how we get away with our structure of the uh, the cooperative agreement is because it's unanimous. It doesn't matter how many votes you get. <laughs> yeah, That's, those are the two. The only two documents we specify in the cooperative agreement, and they say they have to be unanimous. So. Mm -hmm. Which is why all of the work preliminarily to make sure that we've um, been keeping up and the adjustments as we go. Um, the last days is generally not the best time to start a whole new discussion. So, you know, again, if you've got questions of staff between now and then, please ask those questions and uh, just keep on digging into these. So when we do get to May, we are in a really good space to, you know, get to the goal. Get these done so we get the money so we can build the project, which we all need. All right, thank you. Um, anything else for the good of the order? Going once, going twice. All right, well, then the time is about 1 20 and we are adjourned. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hope you